Uh, thank you so much to Nathan and to Petar for organizing this conference and the invitation to share with you some of my work as well. It's also a pleasure to follow Sergei's talk and to have a chance to answer questions with him afterwards. Uh, Stephen is going to help me uh, with a second set of hands as we do a kind of walk through this project, which is a digital poetics project I created about 12 years, uh, I created in 2012. And I am going to read. That's your alarm. Do you hear it? Is it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The question is whether or not this is uh, an authentic moment or choreographed. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, first, I'll start out with a, a quote uh, from Deleuze and Guattari. Writing has nothing to do with meaning. It has to do with land surveying and cartography, including the mapping of countries yet to come. The talk I'll give today is called Gibber, Ecopoesis, or Gibber. Gibber is a transdisciplinary site-specific project created during my 2012 Queensland Poetry Residency that combines sound, visual, conceptual, and digital poetries with acoustic ecology and countermapping. Spawning from an ecopoetics that applies the three environmental R's of reduce, reuse, recycle to creative process, Gibber surveys interconnection between ideas and realities of land, bird, human, signified, signifier, all founded on a gentle interrogation of the language nurtured here, here being Queensland, Australia, the site of my residency and the generation of this work. Gibber includes field audio recordings and photo documentation of biotic and abiotic collaboration, synesthetic museums of sound, and an archive of a multi-source polyphonic exquisite corpse composed live via Twitter by 25 international poets. Today, we'll walk through Gibber as an ecopoesis and an attempt to countermap the literary genre of travel writing. So I'll ask Stephen if you would move to the Australian languages map. He'll go all the way up to the very top. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with the uh, exact layout of Australia, Queensland is one of five states, and it's the largest state. It's located from about here up. So it's the, the east, northeast of Australia. It's the most uh, biodiverse uh, area with uh, eight distinct bioregions, that's quite a lot, ranging from desert to temperate rainforest to tropical rainforest. Signs, as we know, are ordering systems. We accept names as fact. When I arrived in Queensland, I held two questions in mind. What is the language of here? What is the language nurtured here? My emphasis on language related directly to witnessing though not necessarily comprehending the types of ordered systems present culturally and ecologically. While I understood English as the dominant colonialist language in Australia, and I'd seen detailed maps of Australian Aboriginal languages, this being the example here, and Stephen, if you take the, the mouse and just kind of mouse over, you'll get a bit of a closer look at the different regions and languages uh, represented within those regions some of the languages being existent and some extinct. I was keen to consider language as an ordering system that may exist outside of human creation as well. It may be conceptually possible for humans to converse with ecosystems and their components, but would take practice to learn an encoded system through which meaning may be transferred. Through what signs does weather communicate? Could an Arctic turn be considered a travel writer if her flight patterns are engaged as communicative material? As Mary Louise Pratt wrote, the journey and the writing about it are inseparable projects. 
I knew from the outset of my journey to and through Queensland that I would be engaged in a constant stream of dialogue, of linguistic exchange, whether or not I had fluency in the languages. Jibber showcases some of the conversations I had with Australian ecosystems and their biotic and abiotic components. I collaborated with freshwater lakes and with ocean surf. I audio recorded sound walks through dense jungle, early morning island arousal, and a cattle pen. Instead of trying to write about the experience, thereby naming it via description, I opted to classify or categorize based on sensory engagements of eye or of ear through documentation of conversation and the collision of naming practices with the ecosystems and their components. Could an innovative contemporary travel writing include the undoing of what we think we know, the abandonment of word as we know it, to stand with the fear and pleasure entrenched in our imponderabilia. I'll ask you to go back to the site itself. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to just do a very, very quick uh, kind of table of contents to give you a sense of what's within the site. And then we'll tunnel in deeper to look at just a few of the, of the squares as examples. Um, and I'll ask you to, to click on each, but we won't dwell. Um, the first one here is an essay kind of introduction. Uh, below that, we have another essay. Everything down the left-hand side, there are essays, and the material there is basically what I'm reading out loud today. And if you jump back to the, the start. Yeah. Um, we'll skip the second square when it comes up. You think it's not working, the internet? Uh, sure. Yeah, oh, there it is. Okay. This will work more easily. Yeah. Okay. So maybe try clicking just on Jibber on the bottom. This would be a very boring talk, I think. <laughs> You'd all be sad not to, to see the images. I won't ask you to click on anything at the moment. Um, <laughs> not that you weren't successful before. Um, this, this second column in, uh, we'll, get, we'll look at that last with the bird. Um, and as well, everything below will also have a deeper look into. So I won't go into detail right now. It will give us a quick sense of, of this one, just if it happens. Fingers crossed. Um, one of the things that I did, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, was I collected all of the words, all of the place names in Queensland that have the word land within them. Um, this is epic slow. There we go. Yeah. Um, so I made a, a, a digital poem, but also used the, the textual material generated here, the, the, the words, the place names, uh, in, a, in a later piece as well that, that we will click through. Um, and then I had mentioned, one of the last things I had mentioned uh, was that about a, a performance that came about uh, at the end of the residency that included 25 international poets. They were mainly from uh, 
Australia, Canada, the United States, Iceland, Germany. Um, and this is, a, I guess, the, the archive of the performance that had taken place in real time. Um, they were kind of taking apart some of the discussion that we had been having, uh, some of the text that I had generated uh, around the Jibber project and their own responses to seeing some of the images that I was uh, generating. Yeah, and we'll look through the rest of this as we go. Um, so that gives us a little bit of a sense of just what's there overall. Um, I might ask you to pull up uh, in, the in the third row, second column, that's it. That one to start. Yeah. Okay. We can just wait before we play, I think. So this is in a section that's called Museum of Landscape. Who utters the poem? The poetic subgenres of sound poetry and visual poetry have helped to expand my notion of what a poem may be by focusing on the sensual materiality of languages. I listen to the soundscapes of Queensland to hear what poems are improvised by biotic and abiotic entities. The soundscape, defined as the sonic environment, is considered part of a community's collective resources and therefore falls under the legislative area of common property rights. Communities worldwide currently face a large-scale devaluation of natural sounds, in part because they're so elusive and foreign to contemporary societies. In essence, urban-bound humans have lost an inbuilt sensitivity to and awareness of sound as a common resource. Acoustic ecology studies the impact that human-produced sounds have on biota with, within shared soundscapes, and conversely, the impact that soundscapes have on human health. Over the past few decades, researchers in the field of acoustic ecology have placed greater emphasis on the soundscape in their studies of birds, amphibians, and marine life. And these studies are beginning to net results that indicate invasive sounds negatively impact the lives of inhabitants. Noise, defined as unwanted sound, can impact wildlife by harming health, reproduction, survivorship, habitat use, distribution, abundance, or genetic distribution or creating detectable changes in behavior. Biodiverse regions are often rich in ecosystem services, including those frequently exploited by industries such as mining, forestry, and tourism. These industries bring with them changes to the indigenous soundscape, which often are marked by increased decibel levels, vibration, and less distinction in frequency spectra. Technological noise, caused by aircrafts as well as rural industries such as forest and mining, have significant impact on biophonies, biophony being um, a word created by acoustic ecologist Bernie Krauss, who lives in the United States, uh, to refer to biologically diverse soundscapes. And as such, is being met with abatement legislation. Local externalities of vehicles include congestion, noise, and air pollution. Indeed, noise from transportation has the capacity to scare off most large mammals, even in areas where wildlife is plentiful. Noise pollution from agriculture and industry are also proven to have severe repercussions for aquatic ecosystems. Even in the dense jungle of far north Queensland, it was impossible to capture minutes-long audio devoid of human-produced sounds from vehicles or bodies, mine included. By Arcadia Beach on Magnetic Island, I eventually embraced these sounds as human collaboration rather than boiling in my frustration of how pervasive human touch is, even in undeveloped territory. But here we'll sample excerpts from the ecosystem sound poems recorded for Jibber.
go down to where it says source at the very bottom. Yeah. And then choose south. One of the uh, soundscapes that surprised me the most was a visit to a cattle pen in the outback. Um, all of the cows had been uh, brought together uh, in very close quarters in order to assess health. Uh, and of course, I've heard cows many times in my life, especially having grown up in a, in a rural environment in northern Canada. Uh, but this time when listening to the cows, I heard, I heard their, their, their voices in a way that I hadn't before. Would you play the first one? The sonority of their voices in combination uh, especially starts to verge on a musicality of some kind, um, hitting different pitches and coming in at different uh, patterns. Uh, I, I had never listened to them from that, from that angle before. Um, next I'm going to ask if you'll flip through kind of at your own leisure, Stephen, down in the asemia section. Um, any of these, you might start with bubble and then when you get bored of, of going through the slideshow, you can move to another one. Must writing be understood as a human activity? What qualifies as writing instrument and a surface? Asemic writing is a form of literary composition comprised of illegible script. In other words, the visual material of the composition identifies as letter forms, but there is no decode process available to confirm phonemes or semantic attachment to the visual. My interest in acemic writing is born of an acemic reading practice amongst more than human writers, where I situate myself amongst biotic and abiotic entities to see if I can touch that ages old enthusiasm to in interconnect with an environment by recognizing the linguistic within its body. When I submit my estranged self to the power of listening and sensing within an ecosystem, I strive to stretch beyond semantics, but also to witness my constant impulse to construct meaning. In these moments, I dream it's possible that a world of signifiers explodes the dominant human language used to name and to know them. In this dream, acemic writing populates and inscribes landscapes. Through gibber, I actively question embedded notions of what bodies, be they human, water, weather, other, are capable of or even constantly composing, as well as how to ethically read, converse with, collaborate with, and or interpret non-human entities. Within gibber, I took several photographs of an environment-based text. I did not know what it communicated to me except that I had a notion a communication was being proffered. Certainly there were forms, lines and repetition, something imposed on top of another instead of ink on paper, here we have barnacles on rocks, fungi on bark, paths forged through sand, distinct forms linked with other forms. Similar to immersion in foreign human languages, Immersion in foreign bioregions heightens one's capacity to sense environments partly removed from the immediate superimposed semantics we inherit. Looking at organic litter on a beach, I know little more than cursory names like leaf, shell, seed. In Queensland's Daintree and, later, Magnetic Island, complex patterns of little balls of sand littering beaches mesmerized as tides receded. 
It took two days of studying to eventually spy heavily camouflaged crabs scuttling amidst the balls and into the holes nearby them. The sand balls and their intricate arrangements indicated a deep logic at work, but one as yet I was not equipped to decode. Within the field of cultural geography, reading a landscape or an environment has become a popular metaphor. Though asserting that landscapes are passive texts waiting to be actively engaged by readers is ethically spurious. If we hover for a moment though with the notion that an environment can be interpreted or read, then the implication is that the environment itself is comprised of, or better yet, actively composing meaning, possibly as a written text. In this case, ecosystems and their biotic and abiotic components embody the capacity to write. The literary output of more than human writers offers humans to develop a practice of asemic reading, where we find ourselves unable to comprehend what is composed, but assured that it holds its own inherent logic and that it is indeed communicative. Such an ideological shift away from the superiority of speciesist anthropocentri anthropocentrism allows a poetical repositioning to ecocentrism where biotic and abiotic entities are capable agents of communication. Stephen, I'll ask you to go to the violence section now. If you go to Gibberland at the bottom. And it's the second one. Thank you. Gibber partially works in a conservationist mode to document ephemeral components of natural history through performative and or poetic procedures and through which the museum contents can be decoded via an act of synesthesia. Photographing words housed in glass vials or printed and pinned on transparent paper is a, perform is a performance in collaboration or interaction with environments. How can I offer objects to the will of water or wind? Glass vials might represent the moment when the urge to identify, name, possess, grips the body. These vials extend beyond encoded messages in bottles to become synesthetic museums of soundscapes, recalling human utterance within Queensland locations. They also situate within environments, words used to name those environments. In violence, which is this section's title, the glass vial acts as a type of invisible or visible frame that encapsulates a part to isolate its wholeness. The vial could be akin to a novel or book, which can also function as a kind of visible, invisible frame. Where the photograph offers an intimate, an, an initial frame and field akin to margin and page in which the writing appears, the glass vial pro, uh, provides evidence of an attempt to possess. This act of possession is inherent in our naming instincts, where while holding the capacity to apply a name, we then use a word to indicate a vast field of knowledge within a succinct signifier. A word as signifier acts as a vessel to transport meaning. A body may also act as a signifier to transport meaning. A word within a body acts as a signifier within a signifier, thereby complicating an ability to connect with the word as an independent entity. The glass vial, in some ways, may represent this moment of translating the signified into signifier, if a signifier is likened to an empty vessel filled with meaning. And then I'll ask you to shift to, uh, I think it's Gibberland. So Gibberland, Gibberland, I think. Yep. In Gibberland, the English word land, as it has been as it has been incorporated into 1,440 anglicized Queensland's place names, was collected, sorted, and pinned for preservation. This offers for consideration how language, in particular English, has been used to colonize locations. Similar to the process in violence, the pin transparencies were used in site-specific performance to juxtapose the act of naming with the places represented through the naming. In each instance, photography documented the performance, and the resulting archive could be simultaneously considered a visual poem, a sound poem through the act of synesthesia, a performance poem, or something altogether non-poem. Through the limiting act of the collector, the archive provides a chance to inspect English via the environments in which it has become dominant. 
This inspection helps to relocate language within natural contexts. A gesture intended to thwart unexpected dangers associated with slipping too far into a self-referential symbolic world through representation that is neglected or forgotten its source. Is the photograph the poem and or the performance? Does the, per does the poem or performance commence once a bottle or transparent pinwheel is introduced into an environment? Does the poem or performance commence when words are first printed? Is all of this a process working towards a poem not yet composed? Is the process the poem? I think we've got just two sections to go. I'll ask you if you'd please uh, go down to Gibberland again and choose Signet. Yep, thank you. Societal attitudes are both programmed through and transformed by our vocabularies and how we organize language, which in turns both which in turn both reflects and organizes how we perceive our relationships with the ecosystems in which we exist. One of the keys to address environmental disconnection, dissociation, and degradation may be to incite a shift that focuses on language awareness. Through this, we may evaluate and adjust our human actions to healthier, sustainable behaviors. In English language usage, we might start by reflecting on the inferred hierarchy present within pronouns, where humans are granted multiple pronouns, while non-human entities are usually referred to by object pronouns, it, they, them, except in special, often familiar circumstances. When this hierarchical application is used by the animal industry, also known as livestock production, it, as a diminutive pronoun, not only indicates hierarchy, but also likens non-human beings to objects. We might also look at how environmental terminology and circulation can hide the reality of a situation. In Queensland, the term free roaming koalas is used to refer to wild koala populations. This term is designed in some respects to invoke a sense of serenity in its witness. Conversely, however, the term hides the reality of habitat loss due to human construction, roadworks, towns, mining. The largest free-roaming koala colony worldwide is, confi is confined to Magnetic Island, a small island of 52 square kilometers in the Coral Sea off the Queensland coast, half of which is allotted in as a conservation site. In both the English pronoun and environmental Terminology examples, the potential exists for standardized usage to shift, as it has in the past to reflect today's current applications. Recently, I've become aware of my reliance as an English speaker or writer upon nature-based comparisons, which can help us to learn about the world around us and to build resonance, compassion, empathy with non-human beings and ecosystems on which we interdepend and with whom we coexist. However, anthropomorphic idioms, colloquialisms, and cliches as forms of comparison that have entered off use linguistic use may be contributing to contemporary ideological unwellness by normalizing comparisons that strip their signified entities, non-human beings, ecosystems of beingness. In an increasingly urban world struggling with nature deficit disorder, where less time spent outdoors leads to increased behavioral problems in humans, Comparisons that obviate human detachment from direct experiential knowledge become part of the problem, a problem born in part from ideology reified by language usage. Is there anything ethically untenable about likening nature to humans or human behavior? How do comparisons of one to another potentially reify an ideological separation of humans from nature? How could non-human entity comparisons potentially deride, devalue, or crutify uh, to use an Icelandic term that means to make bizarrely cute or emotionally resonant in a naive sense, mm -hmm. represented species or places. Is the reflex or need for this ideological separation so deeply rooted that we're no longer sensitized to linguistic, linguistic behavior that enacts the separation? What ethical responsibilities inform how we use language as our primary medium for creative production? For what purposes are we writing about non-human beings and ecosystem components in our literary works? Is it largely to draw anthropocentric alliances that support comprehension of human nature, while at its behest, belittlement, aggrandizement, romanticization, and or lack of acknowledgement of non-human beings and ecosystem components? 
An anthropocentric viewpoint would argue that it's inescapable for humans to self-review at all, uh, to self-refer at all times and in all of our gestures. While I agree with this, I also believe it's both possible and absolutely necessary to embrace more ecocentric or biocentric views with respect, which respect the inherent value of non-human species and ecosystems. Given this, how can ecocentrism influence and permeate language usage? And the last section that we'll jump to here is the, the bird. Again, what is the poem? Or better yet, where is the poem? Is the process the poem? Does this documentation of the process form a kind of poetry suite, long poem, meta poem, as the signifier's arc is signified? Again, what is the language of any here? How do we grow awareness of our own linguistic predilections as we sense our ways through English in an unfamiliar environment? This is a field of text. This text may be a field. Through the field, we perceive the ecosystem on and in which we're interdependent. Through this field, we perceive beingness. We witness, we listen. We listen to our own urges to comprehend, to name. If we listen and witness long enough, may our anthro transform to eco through poesis embodied by not just the field, but by the field. And I'll finish with, with uh, uh, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, list of how to have a conversation with the landscape. Number one. Learn about the landscape before you enter into it. Number two, begin by introducing yourself. Number three, be aware of your internal monologue. Number four, listen. Number five, be genuinely interested. Number six, give the landscape time to think and respond. Number seven, synchronize. Number eight, maintain the equilibrium. Number nine, know when the conversation is over. Number 10, practice having conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen.